uh, let's uh, let's proceed to the talk. So today we will have talk by Sylvia Buti uh, that will be on distributed constraint satisfaction problem. Oh, yes. yes, thanks, Jacob. So uh, I hope you can all see my screen. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about the distributed constraint satisfaction problem, and in particular, I will be looking at its complexity. Uh, so this is some joint work with Victor Dalmau, who's my supervisor. Now, um, okay. Uh, I will just start by defining what I mean by CSP. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the topic, but just to summarize the, the notation. Let D be a finite domain and uh, let gamma be a finite set of relations over D. Now, an instance of the constraint satisfaction problem of over gamma is a triple where X is a set of variables, D is the domain, as we said before, it's finite, and C is the set of constraints uh, over the variables. And now a constraint is a pair where uh, consisting of a scope that is a tuple um, of variables from X and a relation from the constraint language gamma. And now we say that I is satisfiable if there exists a map uh, from the set of variables to the set of domains such that every relation, well, every constraint is satisfies. That means that the component-wise application of this map to the scope of the constraint belongs to the respective relation. And now just to point out, uh, we consider the case where the domain is unique. So every variable uh, has the same domain. And the distributed CSP framework uh, is very similar. It originated in 1992 um, as a formal uh, framework for some multi-agile system problem. And similarly, so we have a finite domain D and a constraint relation gamma over D. Uh, an instance of the distributed CSP over gamma is a tuple that contains, uh, again, a set of variables, a finite domain, and a set of constraints that are defined as above. And additionally, we have a finite set of agents, which we call A, and uh, a subjective function alpha, which basically assigns the control of every uh, variable and every constraint to a single agent in the set of agents. We make a fundamental assumption that there are as many agents as the sum of variables and constraints, which means that every agent will control, control exactly either one variable or one constraint. And now, originally, the DCSP was defined for just binary relations. In our work, we extend it so that it also allows for non-binary non relations. Uh, however, I want to point out that uh, all this framework can be simplified in the binary case so that we only have agents controlling the variables and we do not need agents for the constraints as well. Now, um, the decision problem for the distributed CSP is the finest follow. We have an algorithm, a distributed algorithm will solve the CSP of gamma if uh, this algorithm terminates. And at termination, every process correctly states that, I, uh, that the instance i is satisfiable if it is, and that it is not satisfiable if it is not. Similarly, a distributed algorithm uh, solves the search problem for the CSP of gamma. If given an instance of the CSP of gamma, it solves the decision problem first. And then if the instance is satisfiable, um, the terminated state also contains a value of the domain for every variable, such that the, as a whole, the, the assignment given by these values is a satisfying assignment. And uh, later I will describe exactly what I mean by a distributed algorithm. So now about distributed system, a message passing network or a distributed network consists of a finite set of processes that are connected by communication channels. Uh, these processes can perform three kind of events. They can send messages, receive messages, and perform any kind of internal events that can be calculations, uh, changes of states, decisions, etc. cetera. Uh, we make some fundamental assumptions on this network. First of all, we assume that communication is synchronous. That means it proceeds in round and no message is uh, sent in the new round before every, uh, every process has received the messages in the previous round. Now, this is an assumption that uh, is just made to simplify our computations. 
Uh, and indeed, all our algorithms can also be run in the asynchronous framework just by applying a simple synchronizers. However, the opposite is not true. So um, in the, there are some algorithms that might work in the asynchronous uh, framework that do not work in the synchronous one. So the complexity here might be different. Secondly, we assume that the network is anonymous. So that means that the processes do not have IDs. Um, or rather, either they do not have IDs, for example, because they don't have the hardware to create them, or they cannot store them, or they might have the IDs, but they are unable to share them with their neighbors. Um, this, again, this assumption can be justified by privacy reasons, but we will see later that it is very important to make the problem interesting in itself. And finally, we assume that the, uh, every process runs the same algorithm and that this algorithm is deterministic. Again, this assumption uh, goes together with the anonymity assumption because if the processes had access to randomness, then they could uh, create random IDs just by flipping a coin or, or with a random number generator. And they could also break ties in um, just by flipping coins, for example. Now, from these three assumptions, it follows that in general, it is impossible to elect a leader in the network. Uh, that means that it is also impossible to gather all the information about the CSP to a single process. And therefore, we cannot solve the CSP just by gathering all this information and then using uh, a standard CSP, classical CSP algorithm, which means that our framework, the CSP framework, is strictly different from the classical CSP. And therefore, it, um, there is space for some interesting new results here. Now, how do we encode an instance of uh, the CSP in a message passing network? This is very simple. We consider a bipartite graph, um, a labeled bipartite graph. So the vertex set is given by the set of agents. And in particular, the bipartition is given by, on the one side, the set of uh, agents that control variables, and on the other side, the set of agents that control the constraints. And uh, obviously, there is an edge between a variable agent and a constraint agent, if and only if that variable participates in the scope of uh, that constraint. Now, the edges are labeled uh, with the position where the variable appears in the scope and the relation of that constraint, which means uh, that all the variables and constraints can have all the information that they need about the CSP instance just by looking at the labels of the edges that are incident uh, in the, that are incident to them in this constraint uh, network, uh, sorry, in the message passing network. Now, before I state the main results, I need to just uh, define what I mean, uh, what is poly polymorphism. Again, I'm sure everyone knows this already, but uh, just to be clear, a polymorphism of RTM is a function uh, on, this, on the domain of, uh, sorry, polymorphism of a constrained language of RTM is a function on the domain of that constrained language, uh, such that every relation from the constrained language is invariant under the coordinate wise application of this map to any set of uh, m-tuples from the relation. And moreover, we say that a function is symmetric if its result doesn't change if we permute its arguments. And now, finally, we're ready to state the, the main results of our work. That is our main theorem that the decision problem for DCSP of gamma is tractable in polyno polynomial time, even only if uh, gamma has symmetric polymorphisms of all arities. Otherwise, uh, the DCSP of gamma cannot be solved in finite time. So here, actually, we have a dichotomy that is different from the classical CSP in the sense that we don't have empty completeness, but actually, we, we have that either a problem is tractable in polynomial time or it is not solvable at all. And now, these results can easily be extended to the search problem. And in fact, we have the same dichotomy. Uh, the search problem for DCSP of gamma is tractable in polynomial time if and only if for gamma, uh, well, the, the set of polymorphisms of gamma contains a symmetric polymorphism of a priority, and otherwise we cannot solve it in finite time. Now, just to give an example of uh, these results, for instance, if we take two colorability, uh, now two colorability does not have a symmetric polymorphism of RIT2, and um, therefore it 
it falls in the set of intractable languages. And this can, seen, can be seen easily, for example, if we take an instance that is a ring, um, where we apply the, the two collaborative relation between every, well, every pair of variables in the ring. And it's easy to see that the search problem here cannot be solved because if all the processes start in the same state uh, and the algorithm that they run is the same throughout, the, throughout every run, then they will always be in the same state and therefore they will always output the same solution. So no matter how long this algorithm runs for, um, we will never be able to have two processes that output different values for, for the, their variables, their respective variables. And therefore, two colorability cannot be solved in the search, uh, search problem. Uh, to see why it cannot be solved in the decision problem is a bit more difficult, and I will uh, talk about it later. On the other hand, for example, if we consider any binary relation that has bounded width, we know that it can be solved by our consistency, and our consistency can easily be implemented in a distributed framework. So uh, given any instance, we can solve it in, in the DCSP framework. Now, I'm going to start talking about uh, intractable languages and why uh, if we don't have a symmetric polymorphism of summarity, then there are no algorithms that solve the DCSP of gamma. But before that, um, I have to introduce a new concept uh, that is the concept of iterated decree. Now, this concept comes from graph theory and it is quite simple. Um, the idea is to um, calculate a partition of a graph by iteratively dividing the, the vertices into finer and finer partitions. And this is, uh, these partitions like, are given by this algorithm that's called iterated color refinement uh, or one dimensional by Spiler Lehman algorithm. Basically works as follows. The first degree or sorry, the zero degree is just given by the degree of the vertex in the graph. So for instance, here, we have that every node in this graph has degree two, except for these nodes that are highlighted in green that have degree three. And now the k degree, k degree degree of a node is just the multiset of k minus one degrees of uh, the node's neighbors. So for instance, in, in this example graph, we have that uh, every green node has three neighbors. And it has two neighbors that have degree two and one neighbor that has degree three. So its first degree would be two, two, three. While for instance, this red node, they have two neighbors and both their neighbors have degree two. So their first degree is now two, two. Uh, it's easy to see that actually this partition that I give here by, by dividing them in three colors is a stable partition that is um, a fixed point. So we cannot divide it further. And in general, it is also easy to see that uh, after at most n iterations, where n is the number of uh, vertices in the graph, we will reach a stable, uh, stable point. So there will, it will not be more possible to divide the partition further. Uh, now, originally this uh, concept of iterated degree was, um, was defined as a heuristic to test for graph isomorphism. That is, if we have two graphs, and we run uh, the iterated color refinement algorithms, uh, we obtain a degree sequence, that is the sequence of fixed point degrees for both graphs. And we know that if their iterated degree sequence is different, then the two graphs cannot be isomorphic. However, the opposite is not true. Uh, for instance, this is an example where we have two different graphs. This is the one that we were looking at before. And this is a graph that has the iterated, the same um, iterated degree sequence. However, it's easy to see that these two graphs are not isomorphic because for example, uh, the left one is too colorable, but the right one is not. Now, as an extension uh, of the iterated degree concept to CSP, we, we define it as follows. Um, basically now we're not looking at graphs, but bipartite graphs that have labels. So. The first thing that we want to make sure is that uh, any two nodes of the graph that belong to different sets of the B partition get a different degree at all times. So we start by defining the zero degree as just a symbol that differentiates the degree of variables from the degree of constraints. And then because we have labels and we do not want to lose this information, 
uh, the K degree is defined as a multi set of tuples that contain the K minus one degree of the neighbors of this, uh, of this node and the label that connects uh, the nodes with its neighbors. Now we say that two nodes are degree equivalent if their K degree degree is the same for all K. And we have the following uh, crucial observation. So uh, given an instance of DCSP um, and given two nodes that have the same iterated degree, we have that uh, any terminal indecision algorithm over this instance will output the same decision at the two processes uh, corresponding to this variable, to, to these nodes. And moreover, uh, any terminal search algorithm uh, will output the same assignment for the same the, these two nodes if the if the instance is satisfied. And um, additionally, we also have that if we run uh, a distributed algorithm over two separate instances that have the same degree sequence, and um, the algorithm will output the same solution on both instances. Uh, now, again, before I I go to the proof of intractability. I'm going to define a construction of a gadget um, that I call the indicator problem. Um, so given a constraint language gamma over a finite domain D and a positive integer K, I define the indicator problem of order K for gamma to be the instance um, given by, uh, basically has the set of variables being the set of K tuples over of the domain. And then for every relation of gamma, and every set of K tuples from this relation, there is a constraint in the indicator problem that is given basically as, uh, as follows. The ith variable of the scope is the tuple given by the ith uh, coordinate of these K tuples that I took before. And the important observation about the indicator problem is that the set of solutions to, to this indicator problem corresponds exactly to the set of k area polymorphisms of gamma. And secondly, we also observe that uh, for any two tuples in the, in the set of variables of the indicator problems that are permutations of each other, these two tuples will have the same iterated degree. This can, be, is, uh, this can be seen easily either by induction or by just observing that actually these two tuples, uh, there will be an automorphism between them. So if they're automorphic, then they're also either at the degree equivalent. So finally, I'm going to give some intuition on how to prove that the search problem is intractable for the intractable languages. Um, assume that gamma does not have a symmetric polymorphism of variety k and consider the indicator problem of order k. Now, um, from our observation that I mentioned before, for any two tuples that are permutations of each other, any terminated algorithm will output the same value at them because they have the same iterated degree. Uh, and therefore, this algorithm can solve the CSP of gamma only if there is a solution that assigns the same value to every two tuples that are permutations of each other. But this solution, since it corresponds to a polymorphism, well, it corresponds exactly to a symmetric polymorphism of RTK, which is a contradiction because we just assume that such a polymorphism doesn't exist. So for the search problem, this is quite simple. Uh, for the decision problem, one has to do a little bit more work. Um, the idea again is to construct a gadget that shows that the problem is intractable. However, uh, we could not find one in CSP of gamma but rather we have to define a new relation. So I'm going to briefly talk about PP definitions. We say that the relation is PP definable from a template gamma. If, it, uh, if there exists a PP formula, a primitive positive form formula, which uses only relations from gamma and equality to define you. Uh, by a PP formula, of course, I mean a formula that only uses existential quantifiers, uh, conjunctions, and equality. And uh, we say that U is EFPP definable, uh, which, by which I mean equality free PP definable, if such PP formula doesn't use equality. So it only uses relations from gamma. Now, there's a very well known reduction for CSPs that basically says that if uh, some constraint language gamma prime is PP definable from gamma, 
then um, CSP of gamma prime is log space reducible to CSP of gamma. And we have a similar reduction here in the DCSP framework, but with EFPP definitions. So if a constraint language gamma prime is EFPP definable from gamma, then uh, DCSP of gamma, uh, sorry, if, if the distributed CSP problem for gamma is solvable in polynomial time, then so is the distributed uh, CSP problem for gamma prime. So assuming that gamma does not have a symmetric polymorphism of RTK, we just consider the relation defined as a set of solutions of the indicator problem of RTK. Uh, now it's easy to see that this, um, this definition actually consists of an EFPP definition for, for this relation U. And so because of this reduction that I just mentioned, it is enough to prove that there is no algorithm that solves DCSP of U in finite time instead of, solve, uh, of proving that there is no algorithm that solves DCSP of gamma. And one would do this as follows. Uh, we would uh, find two instances, I1 and I2, of uh, in CSP of U, such that, first of all, they have the same degree of sequence. Uh, and secondly, that one of them is unsatisfiable and the other one is satisfiable. Uh, and again, because of our observation that I mentioned before, that if I run a distributed algorithm on two instances that have the same uh, degree sequence, uh, this algorithm will output the same solution at both the instance instances. Uh, and sorry, the same decision as well on satisfiability. And so because one of them is unsatisfiable and the other one is not, then there is no algorithm that could possibly solve uh, this problem. Now, down to the tractable case. So assuming that a constraint language gamma has a symmetric polymorphism of polarities, we will show that there is an algorithm that solves it in polynomial time. And in particular, it, um, it runs over n square rounds. Uh, every round is not unit time. So actually the total running time is, is this n cube m log n, where n is the number of variables in a constraint uh, satisfaction problem instance, and n is the number of constraints. And the maximum size of a message is m log n. In order to prove this theorem, I'm going to need another observation, uh, which I call the structure theorem. This is interesting in its own right, especially because it is not specific to the DCSP framework, but actually it holds in the CSP context in general. And I'm going to, to discuss it more in detail later, but just to mention, um, the structure theorem states that uh, the following are equivalent. First, that gamma has symmetric polymorphisms of polarities, and secondly, that for every satisfiable instance of CSP of gamma, there exists a satisfying assignment that assigns the same value to any pair of variables that are degree equivalent. So assuming the structure theorem, the, our algorithm to solve tractable languages consists of two phases. The first phase, in the first phase, uh, every process in the network calculates its iterated degree. This is done via a distributed version of the color refinement algorithm. It's very simple. Basically, at every round, every process um, uh, broadcasts their degree and then calculates the next iterated degree and then broadcasts it and calculates it and so on. Now, the naive version of this only takes n rounds. However, the maximum size of a message is m log n. And because we're actually going to use uh, this message later and we're going to process this and this is going to take time, it is convenient to, um, to improve this algorithm by basically trying to decrease the size, the maximum size of a message. And this is done at the cost of increasing the number of rounds. Um, the, the basic idea is that instead of broadcasting the degree in itself, uh, every node would just broadcast a number and this number is unique up to degree equivalence. And in order to calculate this number, um, for every round, one needs an extra n rounds. That's why we get n squared. Now, once every process has calculated its iterative degree and we have reached a stable point, um, then the crucial observation is that thanks to the structure theorem, we can tag messages 
with the degree that has been calculated and use it as its own ID. So now, in a way, the network is no longer anonymous, or better, it is anonymous, but um, we can have non-unique IDs up to degree equivalence. And now, because of this, we can use a distributed and adapted version of JPQ consistency, which is um, some recent work of COSIC, to decide uh, the, the decision problem for the CSP of gamma. And this second phase takes n square rounds, m log n times, uh, sorry, m n log n time. So then we get the bounds that I mentioned before. And the maximum size of a message is n log n. Just to explain a little bit how distributed JPQ consistency works. So every variable process in the network would maintain a set S of X that is a subset of the domain. Uh, and these sets are such that for every solution, if this solution assigns the same value to any pair of variables that are uh, degree equivalent, then the value given by, by the solution to, to X must belong to S of X at all times. So initially, S of X is, um, is just set to be the domain for every variable X. And then at every iteration, we calculate the new SI of X by basically taking the previous SI minus one of X and then removing all the, the elements of the domain that are not consistent with all the other variables in network that are equivalent to X, taking that value. So just to explain a little bit, um, this is an example for a binary relation. Actually, it's free colorability. We know that this is not solvable, but it's just an example. Um, for instance, here, uh, suppose that X and Y are degree equivalent. We have uh, SI of X and SI of Y. And we can see that there is no path from zero here to zero in SI of Y. So one will remove zero from both sets. Uh, on the other hand, for example, there is a path from one here that we can follow to one here. So one will be maintained in this iteration. And once we have computed these new sets, and, uh, which we're going to do for every iteration, uh, and now just to mention that this can be done locally in a way that uh, it will take n rounds. So just by sending messages during n rounds, every process can calculate these new sets locally. So in most uh, n times d iterations, and each iteration consists of n rounds, one can obtain a fixed point. And the crucial observation is that uh, since gamma has symmetric polymorphisms of polarities, and hence it also has bounded width, uh, from the structures theorem that I mentioned before and from the work of Kozik, it follows that one can decide um, satisfiability of the instance just by looking at these sets S of X in the fixed point. In particular, if any one of these sets is empty, then um, the instance is not satisfiable. And this can be easily propagated around the network so that all the processes are made aware uh, that uh, the instance is not satisfiable. Otherwise, if all of these sets are not empty, then the instance is satisfiable and this can be and decided. Now, going back to the structure theorem, uh, I'm going to actually try to prove it for you. Uh, I'll state it again, just for convenience. So the structure theorem states that um, for any finite constraint language gamma, gamma has symmetric polymorphisms of polarities, if and only if for every satisfiable instance of CSP of gamma, there exists a satisfying assignment mu that uh, assign the same value to every pair of variables that are either uh, that are degree equivalent. Now, in order to prove the structure theorem, I'm going to need to use the basic LP relaxation of a CSP. And this is as defined as follows. We have a variable uh, for every pair of, well, we have a variable of the LP for every pair of variables from the CSP and elements of the domain. And we have a variable of DLP for every constraint in the CSP and every tuple T in the relation of the constraint. And this set of variables of DLP are constrained by the following equation. First of all, uh, we require that the, the variables of DLP define a probability distribution for the variables of the CSP over the domain. 
And secondly, we require first that also the variables uh, of the RP that um, for the constraint define a probability distribution over the tuples of the relative relation. And secondly, that the marginals of the probability distributions are consistent. Now we say that BLP decides uh, the constraint satisfaction problem for gamma if for every instance of CSP or gamma, uh, the instance is satisfiable if and only if uh, the basic LP relaxation of that instance is feasible. And it is well known that if gamma has symmetric polymorphisms of all arities, then BLP of gamma decides CSP of gamma. Uh, moreover, the rounding scheme that gives this, this equivalence, which is actually if and only if, also determines that the, um, if the solution given by the LP is such that any two variables, uh, sorry, for, for two variables, we get the same value, basically for every value of the domain, then there also exists a solution that gives the same value to these two variables. And now the proof of the structure theorem would go like this. First of all, we would rewrite the, the BLP in matrix form uh, as so, just by replacing basically every equation with a pair of inequalities. And then we would apply the multiplicative weight of data algorithm to this feasibility problem. Now, NWU is uh, quite a widely used technique in machine learning. And it, basically a weight update technique uh, is quite simple. So suppose that big W is a set of equations in the LP. We define small w to be um, the vector of weights of these equations. So we basically assign a weight to every one of these equations. In initially, all the weights are set to one. And then for t iterations, we do the following. First of all, we calculate the probability vector. That's just the normalized uh, vector uh, of weights. Secondly, we assume that there is an oracle that gives a solution to this feasibility problem over here. And it's important to notice that this feasibility problem is strictly weaker than the previous one, than this. Which means that if we have a solution to the LP, then we definitely also have a solution to this problem over here. The opposite does not hold. Uh, so given this solution by an oracle, we compute the losses as so. Uh, basically, there's one loss for every equation. And then we calculate the new weights just by multiplying um, with the losses. Finally, the algorithm returns uh, the solution that is just the average of all the solutions given by the oracle over the t iterations. Now, it's quite easy to show that uh, if we run NWU for an infinite number of iterations, then we actually get an exact solution to the basic LP. Uh, and in particular, under some technical assumptions on the, on the oracle that are easy to, to be met, uh, in order to get an epsilon approximation for the BLP, it's actually enough to run the algorithm for a number of iterations that is quadratic in one over epsilon. And so clearly, if we let t to infinity, then epsilon goes to zero, so we get an exact solution. And now, again, given the, the algorithm, the multiplicative weight update algorithm, it's not hard to show that the solution given by MWU is not just exact, but also it assigns the same value for every pair of variables that are degree equivalent in the network. And uh, to show this, okay. Um, again, it's, it's not difficult, but just to give you an idea, we will define two more equivalence relations and now on the set of variables of the LP, V, and on the set of equations of the LP, W. Uh, and we say that the vector V is V preserving if it assigns the same value to any two variables of the LP whenever they are V equivalent. And similarly, a vector W is big W preserving if it assigns the same value to any two uh, equations 
V and VW that are V equivalent. Now, consider the oracle that maximizes the left-hand side of this equation. And that's given basically just by assigning one to, to V if its coefficient is positive and zero if its coefficient is negative. It's, it's easy to see that this maximizes the left-hand side and so it must satisfy this feasibility problem. Um, this oracle also satisfies our technical condition that we needed before from the theorem. And so uh, one can show by induction that this, the solution given by this oracle actually guarantees that the, that the solution given by MWU is V preserving. That means it's gonna give the same value to any two variables that are uh, V equivalent. And these variables are V equivalent if and only if um, the corresponding variables in the CSP are degree equivalent. And so once we show that, uh, given that gamma has symmetric polymorphisms of alarities, given the rounding scheme that I mentioned before, um, one can see that uh, basically the solution given by the LP will be the same for every pair of variables that are degree equivalent. And because of this, because of the rounding scheme, then we have a solution of I, of the, the CSP instance, that gives the same value to every pair of variables that are degree equivalent. Now that completes the one direction of the proof of the structure theory. The other direction, luckily, is a lot more simple. So assuming that we have um, a constraint language gamma that satisfies the second condition of the structure theorem. So that means that um, gamma is such that for any satisfiable instance, we have a solution to that instance that gives the same value to every pair of degree equivalent variables. Then we're gonna show that gamma actually has a, um, a symmetric polymorphism of RTK for every K uh, plus, um, greater than one. Consider first the indicator problem of order K and remember that, as we said before, uh, the solutions of the indicator problem of order K define exactly the K-area polymorphisms of gamma. Now, consider then an arbitrary solution. We know that the indicator problem is satisfiable. Um, so considering an arbitrary solution of the indicator problem that satisfies the, this condition too, above, which we know must exist. And remember, so uh, for any pair of tuples in the indicator problem that are permutations of each other, we know that they are degree equivalent. And because they are degree equivalent, given that our solution satisfies the conditions of the structures theorem, then the solution must give the same value to, to these two tuples. And since this solution defines a polymorphism of RTK, it follows that this polymorphism must be symmetric because it gives the same value to any two tuples that are permutations of each other. And so we have a symmetric polymorphism of RTK as required which completes the proof of, this, of the structure theorem and also completes my talk, I believe. So thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, are there some questions, comments? Um, well, well, where do you go next with this? Or it's, uh, it's all done. You started the, uh, the direction and finished it in one paper. Uh, no, no, for sure not. So there's a few, um, a few ways that this can be taken further. Um, first of all, well, we made a couple of assumptions on the network uh, uh, synchronicity, uh, anonymity, and determinism. So while the anonymous assumption can already be taken away because otherwise it, it's trivial, you could look into making the network uh, asynchronous. So that would most likely give rise to a different classification. Um, you could look into allowing for randomness. And again, I don't know where that would take. Um, another interesting point is that actually the DCSP framework is quite similar to graph neural networks. So um, there's, there's actually quite an interesting correspondence there because graph neural networks are also very, very deeply tied to 
this vice valer Lehman test and they did the degree and actually their expressive power is seems to be linked to vice valer Lehman. So it's an interesting direction to see in, in what way these three things are linked together. And yeah, well, then there's more stuff. <laughs> there's just a bit. Um, does it even make sense to, um, to apply this uh, framework to optimization problems? Um, you know, like CSP, so what is CSP, so some of that. Possibly, yeah. One could look into that that direction. So we haven't looked in, at value CSP or, or optimization in the sense, but actually, yes. So DCOP, uh, distributed constraint optimization problem is, is, is also well-defined. There's quite a few papers on that. Um, but again, nothing on the complexity. So that would also need to be analyzed in a way. Some other questions? Maybe I will have a question then. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, my question is about the, the communication model. So yes. in, I think your algorithms basically work in a way that, that the vertices just needs to need to communicate with their neighbors, right? Yes, exactly. They can only communicate with the neighbors in the, in the network. So if you if you change this into you know global global communication, does it change anything? Mm. So you could you would be able to send messages to anyone you want, or maybe a broadcast. So for message. sure, this is not the only network that would work, um, or at least there are cases in which other networks would work. For example, if you have just binary, uh, you could. Use a different network mm -hmm. with global communications. Uh, let me think. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> uh, what could look into that actually? It's. I would imagine it's not very, very feasible for applications in that way, because mm -hmm. in general, if you have a constrained network, it's not super feasible to assume that everyone can communicate with everyone. Mm -hmm. But surely, surely one can look into that. I don't know if, Victor, do you have any idea? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what, what is global communication. I would say that as, as long as you can keep anonymity, I mean, global communication only could speed up what this network those, yes. but but I don't know if you can make a global communications without without revealing anonymity. Anonymity, like yeah, I, I guess like if you want to keep anonymity, the only the only global communication that you can get would be broadcast um, a message to everyone, right? The mm -hmm. same message to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so then I, I guess basically perhaps you will have the same classification, right? Because because uh, perhaps. Yeah, perhaps still like you have the same the same barrier like that, that, that two nodes that have that are that are um the recurrent need need still to behave in the same way and uh, and mm -hmm. then global global perhaps it will only make the algorithm faster but i guess that will get sort of the same the same frontier but, but that's my yeah idea. yeah i agree that i mean that's my feeling as well in the sense that you could if, if you receive more messages in a way that wouldn't help you break the symmetry, it would only give you more information faster, but all the information you're going to get, you're going to get it anyway at some point. It just might take longer because the network is complicated and you, you do, you're not a direct neighbor. But all the information that you're ever going to get, you're going to get in a finite time. And... And so just to, to add communication channels is, is not gonna have to break the symmetry, which is the, the problem for intractable languages. It, it will only make algorithms faster, like Victor says. Yeah. Although one thing that one might look in this model perhaps is that um, you see in, in, in the model that we're looking at, we are hoping at the best to, to, to uh, I mean, let me see, how can I say that? Um, 
by making it distributive, we don't get any improvement. It, actually, the only thing that we get are obstacles, right? Mm -hmm. But perhaps mm -hmm. by looking at global communication, then we, we can study another kind of questions, like which kind of um, which kind of CSPs you can solve them uh, faster in this way than, than, than like for instance classical CSPs. For instance, I don't mm -hmm. can you solve any like in sublinear time? What kind of the CSPs that you can solve in sublinear time now that you can? Communicate like instantly because that, that was a problem when, when we look at this um, initially. So I think it might be interesting to look at in, in that direction, like 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 mm -hmm. like yeah, which which kind of CSPs you can solve like faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, but uh, your algorithm is actually quite fast, isn't it? Like compared yes. to cubic uh, and 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 cube and log n, so. Yeah, how, do, how does this actually compare to the standard algorithm for symmetric polymorphisms? That would be LP. Mm -hmm. Oh, never mind. Sorry. Yeah. LP is matrix multiplication time. Matrix multiplication time. Mm -hmm. So that means this is slightly slower. Faster. Uh, never mind. Yeah. Point. Just being prepared on this. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, okay. Hola. You you made this assumption um, that you have as many. So you have one agent for every variable or constraint. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so how how much of of, of restriction is that? Um, not at all, actually. It's not a restriction in the sense that if you have, for example, say that you have a variable, con sorry, an agent controlling two variables, uh, then that agent can just simulate two agents that control each of them one variable and then just run the algorithm in the same way. Oh, it's no loss of generality. Oh. Sorry? It's, it's no loss of generality, you say. Right? Yeah, no, it, it's. It doesn't lose any generality. 